What's going on everybody? So in today's video, I'm going to be going over exactly what you need to know and what you should do if your tenant stops paying rent. Uh, right now, one of my properties, uh, the tenant is no longer paying their rent. So I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to do, as well as just some general landlord tips and strategies if you come across this situation. So that being said, let's jump into the video. Number one, the very first thing you should do if you are purchasing a rental property, whether it's a single family rental property, a condo, townhouse, single family house, whatever it is, or especially if it's a multifamily property, and you're purchasing it as a rental property with tenants already in there, you need to verify that they're actually paying their rent. So the landlord should easily be able to provide you with some type of bank statements or documents showing that these tenants have paid on time, at least for the last like three to six months. And better yet, you should probably get 12 months of rental receipts showing rental deposits in the landlord's bank account. And if you don't have those and the landlord doesn't want to provide you with those documents, then you need to factor in a worst case scenario and just assume that the tenant probably isn't paying their rent and, uh, you know, work your numbers backwards from there. You know, sometimes you can work out an escrow agreement uh, where maybe you tell the landlord, look, I'm going to hold $10,000 uh, worth of seller proceeds. So in the event that the tenant doesn't pay their rent, you can draw it from that amount. And, you know, the landlord might not agree to that. But if they can't provide you with any type of documents showing that the tenant is actually paying the rent, just assume a worst case scenario and just work your numbers backwards. Now, a property that I just purchased, I actually knew that one of the tenants was not paying their rent. The landlord could not provide any type of receipts and he, he wasn't even hiding it either. He said, look, this person's kind of been back and forth with their rent. You know, he's a nice guy, but he just can't pay, pay the rent. And I was actually okay with that just for the fact that I was getting such an amazing deal that even if it took me a year to get this person out of there, get a better like paying tenant in there, you know, it wasn't going to be too big of an issue. Uh, but you always need to just kind of factor in those variables. Tip number two is that when you're purchasing rental properties, I'd recommend trying to get like at least a duplex, triplex, four unit, or more than that if you can, you know, five, 10, 20, even 100 unit. Because what'll happen, you know, if one tenant's not paying their rent in a hundred unit building, obviously that's not gonna be as big of a deal as if you just have a single family house, and let's say your mortgage is $3,000 a month or something crazy like that, then your tenant it stops paying their rent, which can definitely happen, you know, depending on which tenant you have, you know, you're, you're gonna be screwed. You're gonna be coming out of pocket. So the more units, the better. And the property that I actually purchased where the tenant's not paying their rent, it's a four unit. So one of my tenants is not paying their rent, but the other ones are great tenants, they're paying on time. And it still basically covers my mortgage. So it's not that big of a deal. Yes, I'm losing about $1,000 per month, but I kind of factored this in. Eventually, I'm going to kind of reposition uh, the four unit, get everybody paying their rent, maybe even increase the rents if I do some renovations and the area continues to improve. Uh, but the, the more units generally, the better. It's just better economies of scale overall. And Grant Cardone actually talks about this as well. And if you don't know who Grant Cardone is, I'm sure you probably do. Uh, but he owns like 10,000 units, something crazy, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate. And he got started by purchasing a single family house as a rental. And what happened is that tenant eventually stopped paying their rent and he was out of luck. He, he had to come out of pocket to, to pay the entire mortgage and get this person evicted. He lost, you know, $10,000 or maybe thousands of dollars in that process. And from that point on, he was like, look, I'm only investing in multifamily buildings. He bought a five unit, 20 unit, and now I think he only pretty much buys like 100 unit buildings. Tip number three, if you have a tenant that's not paying their rent, it's not like you need to file for eviction like the next day. You don't need to be like the most strict landlord in the world and just kick them to the curb essentially, you know, after like, let's say a couple days and they're late with their payment or they even tell you they can't make their payment. What I'm doing with this tenant is, you know, I, I'm being nice to them. I'm, I'm trying to work with them. I'm trying to, you know, get them in the best situation uh, because the thing to know about eviction laws is that sometimes it might take like six months or even a year to evict somebody. If the tenant really knows the landlord laws and tenant laws, they can maneuver the system so that it's almost like impossible in some states uh, to do a quick type of eviction. So I'm on a friendly basis with this tenant. Yeah, I'm not pleased that they're, you know, obviously not paying their rent, but I'm not going to evict them. I'm going to give them another month or two. You know, the guy says he's probably going to pay me back. Probably won't happen. But again, I factored this into the equation. And, you know, another thing you can do, you can also offer them cash for keys. So what cash for keys is, and sometimes this happens with foreclosure properties. If you purchase a foreclosure and someone might, might actually still be living in there and you kind of have to get them out of there, is you basically just pay them a certain amount. You can pay them $500, you can pay them $1,000, 2000 I think the highest I've heard of was like ten or even $20,000 just to vacate and leave the property. And each area is going to be different, so you just need to kind of factor in your numbers to what makes the most sense. But if you have an amazing deal and you have a terrible tenant and they're really abusing the, the tenant laws, you know, you might pay them $20,000 and it might make perfect sense. 
Um, I think more of a reasonable number would be like a thousand bucks or maybe one month's rent just to get them out of the property so you can get someone in there renting it, you know, just take the loss and just get a better tenant, which leads me to point number four, which is when you're looking for new tenants and this tenant I actually inherited. So it's not like I chose this person, but when you're looking for new tenants, you need to make your qualification process like extremely strict and difficult for the tenant even to just apply uh, to be chosen as your tenant because you, you want like the 1% or at least the 5% of the best tenants out there. You need to put them through an actual tenant application form. And there's plenty of these examples online. Uh, I think they're like 50 bucks, which you would charge the tenant just to, you know, pay just to apply to be your tenant. And you can find out their credit score. You should get references. You know, you're, you're looking for, like I said, you know, the cream of the crop tenants because ideally this person should should rent from you for a minimum of 12 months if not longer than that i mean the longer the better uh, because what kills you with rental properties and multifamily properties is the turnover so you, you really want to have someone that's going to try to stay for the long term and be a quality tenant think of it almost like a job application some of the best companies in the world they have the most strict job applications where you know you fill out the initial application maybe there's like a hundred people that actually fill out this application and probably some of people do it wrong then the next step is like the first round of interviews. Then there's a second round of interviews. Then you need to send in like a video interview. And then finally, you know, you meet the, the final person and, and pass that interview. So you really need to, to filter through these people. Tip number five is to have a reserve fund of at least three to six months worth of mortgage payments. And ideally more than that, because with rental properties, you need to be prepared if someone doesn't pay their rent. Uh, there could be associated costs, maybe an HVAC breaks. Uh, I had a rental property where the HVAC broke. Um, and, and just different things that, that will come up. So you really need to have just like be sitting on some cash reserves or at least have like some credit um, or a line of credit that you can tap into in a worst case scenario. And obviously the larger the rental property, if you have like a 10 unit building, you know that that's gonna be quite a bit of reserves, but you need to, you need to have that. You need to be on the safe side because different things can happen. Different variables can happen. People can stop paying their rent. Um, different things can come up uh, in the actual apartment itself. So you really got to be uh, prepared for a worst case scenario in any time you're purchasing a rental property. The next tip if you're worried about tenants not paying the rent is just put your property on Section 8. Section 8 is a government sponsored program where the government pays your rent every single month so you don't have to worry about the tenants not paying their rent. Now you do have to meet certain qualifications with the Section 8 process so you have to apply to be in Section 8. However, the government is always looking to add Section 8 properties essentially to their portfolio uh, to give uh, you know low income housing people you know different options. And as far as the requirements for Section 8, it's you know it's really just having a livable house. You know the Section 8 person is going to come make sure there's not broken windows and different egregious things like that. But once you get it up set up on Section 8 and you can check how much income actually uh, each county will have the amount of bedrooms and income associated with that for a section eight. So you can really factor in your rental income from there. And that's great because you don't have to like estimate how much rent you might get because maybe you buy a pretty low price property um, and you're you're wondering, you know, am I, can I rent this out for 2,000, 3,000, 1,000? You know, with section eight, it'll tell you exactly how much you can rent it out for based on the zip code and based on how many bedrooms and bathrooms. Uh, so you'll have your answer right there. And then, you know, you can purchase properties that are pretty low priced a lot of times and rent these out, you know, if they're two or three bedrooms for, for quite a bit of money and get some decent cash flow coming in. All right, so there you have it. And just to summarize this video, if there was three lessons to learn from this video, number one, try to do more units. Uh, the more units, you know, four or five, 10 units, that's gonna be less risky than like just a single family house where if they stop paying, you have to completely pay the mortgage. Uh, number two, make sure you have an extremely strict qualification process for your tenants. Make it difficult for them to apply basically. You know, set your set your rental price right at the market value, but make it very uh, strict and difficult for them to apply so that you can really get the best tenant. And then lastly, number three, um, always have cash reserves available. This is uh, true if you're owning real estate or not. You should always have cash reserves available, but especially if you're owning rental real estate, you need to have minimum three months and, and better yet, you know, six months or even 12 months. You're gonna sleep a lot better at night. Trust me on that one. All right, so thanks for watching this video. And if you haven't already, definitely smash that like button because it helps the YouTube algorithm and also subscribe to the channel for weekly real estate investing videos. And that being said, I'll see you in the next one. All right, bye.